day of our workshop. It's a lighter day, but definitely we've saved some of the best till last. So thank you for sticking around. Um, I'm very delighted now to introduce my colleague, Jan Spies. Jan is a professor in um, operations, information and technology at Stanford, uh, the business school uh, with a courtesy appointment also in economics. Jan works basically on everything. So I think of him as an econometrician, but he also works on mechanism design, statistical decision theory. Today, he's gonna to tell us about regulation or auditing. So unpacking the black box, regulating algorithmic decisions. Please join me in welcoming Jan Spies. Thanks so much. Very glad to be here today. So this is joint work with my colleague, Laura Blattner, who's also at Central Business School and Scott Nelson, who's at Booth. And so in this paper, we're basically asking the question, how can we make progress on economic frameworks for regulating algorithmic decisions that are taken with complex machine learning tools in a way that's kind of responsive to how these tools are actually used in the world? And the motivation very much is the increased reliance on prediction algorithms in many high stakes screening decisions. So um, in many of those screening decisions, we may be worried that there are incentive conflicts because between those who develop or use the algorithm and between um, a regulator who cares about the implications of their use. So just to give you some examples, as human medical testing, we have an insurance company that may be worried that a hospital that uses an algorithm to target patients is actually over-testing. In hiring, an employer may care about um, equity considerations uh, of the job offers, while a hiring agency may not fully incorporate that same goal. Or in lending, which is the case that I will focus on today, because this is the case where we'll be able to show you some data, we may have a financial regulator who worries about disparate impact or model risks um, that are implied by a bank, bank's use of a credit scoring algorithm in order to decide who to give credit to. And, and so the move to automated rules in this case, meaning that we are moving, for example, from a loan officer deciding in a case-by-case -case basis who should get credit, to an algorithm who does so systematically, on the one hand, uh, brings with it a large opportunity, which is that in many cases, we are now able to describe the decision rules that are used systematically because they're mathematical objects that we can query and we can analyze how they've been constructed. At the same time, many of these algorithms are actually so complex that it's very hard for us to describe them completely. And so that basically has spawned uh, many approaches to describing what algorithms do that now are starting to be used in cases like financial underwriting in order to describe algorithms. Um, so for example, explainability tools that try to turn this complex algorithm into a simple description. Um, and so in this paper, what we are asking is how we can effectively mitigate incentive conflicts if black box algorithms are too complex to be fully described, and we may have to rely on some simplified descriptions of what they do. And so specifically, the starting point to my investigation today is that the complexity of algorithms means that while there is this promise that we can now describe what they do mathematically, there's actually a limitation because the agents in our model and specifically a regulator may not be fully able to describe um, what this algorithm does because it's simply represented by too many parameters, uh, by too many different uh, cases to which it could be applied. And um, then there would be in this world a first policy option that we consider. A first policy option would just be to say, let's just restrict whoever uses uh, or de develops the algorithm to only giving us algorithms that are so simple that we can fully describe them. So in a credit scoring case, that could be, we don't allow you to use a neural network that is too complex for us to describe. We restrict you to using some simple logistic regression with plenty of variables. Now, I don't think it's trivial to describe a logistic regression with plenty of variables, but at least there's a sense that now we can inspect it and we can use our experience to understand what this function does um, in different cases that we care about, for example, in a downturn in the economy or how it treats different people differently. A second policy option would be that we instead require that the maker of the algorithm provides some simple description of this complex algorithm that tells us about its first order behavior and for example, identify some key drivers. So for illustration here, I've basically illustrated uh, SHAP. So one way of saying we have this complex algorithm can be associate um, the main drivers, or can we identify the main drivers of the decisions we are taking and can we quantify which uh, of these drivers is how important or which impact it has. And such diagnostic tools are widely available, but you know, from, from an economic point of view, 
Um, they are often based on mathematical axioms, like uh, Chef, for example, being based on Shapley axioms that are not necessarily um, have a clear connection to um, an economic justification in a specific case where we care about specific outcomes. And so what we're kind of trying to do here is we're trying to ask the question, if I have an economic objective, if I care about uh, certain outcomes um, not occurring, for example, I care about avoiding disparate impact, or I care about avoiding excess risk in a downturn, then does this give us some access to the question how we could justify such explainers um, from an economic point of view and could th whether that could help us to basically in a better design of them. Um, so what, what, are, what is our main approach here? So theoretically, we want to make precise and justify um, explanations of complex machine learning, machine learning models in a principal agent model where explainability is not an end in itself. So we're not just saying we need explainability because we all want to be able to explain but instead we see it as a means to an end. So we say there's some policy objective and explaining or describing the algorithm in simple ways could help us to achieve that because it increases the options of a regulator uh, to provide effective oversight. And so in and start as examples, I will show you as well as the data calibration that I have for you today, I will argue that policies that simply ex ante restrict the function heavily, for example, say you're only allowed to use simple logic models at least in the applications we looked at, are inefficient relative to doing oversight based on simple descriptions of the algorithms that allow more flexibility because I can now basically um, audit in a way that is more responsive to whatever state the world is in. But that at the same time, the design of that audit actually matters. So specifically auditing based on a simple representation that is kind of a general purpose um, re representation that basically tries to maximize the information I retain about the algorithm is not necessarily the best way of doing it because in a delegation framework, I care about very specific aspects of the algorithm that are relevant to the specific conflict of interest between, in this case, the principal and the maker of the decision, uh, the, the maker of the algorithm, and that we can improve outcomes by thinking about which description of the algorithm is most helpful because the description is kind of does well on average is not necessarily the one that I care most about if I have a specific target in mind. We then empirically demonstrate that those results matter in an application to credit underwriting that I will go over at the end of this talk. Um, and then we also practically link this to a project we have with FinDirect Lab, which is a DC based think tank um, that tries to understand how um, regulation applies and has to evolve in the face of innovations in fintech lending that would allow us to increase access to credit. Um, and with them, we basically evaluated a number of commercially available tools in this space and asked the question to which uh, degree can those commercially available tools actually respond to requests by regulators. So just want to connect to Solitage and I won't be able to do justice to all the areas um, because of course, this is like working in a very interdisciplinary and fast moving world. So a first literature that I'm, I'm mentioning here because probably the one that's closest to my previous work is one that analyzes data analysis with conflicts of interest and application concerns or more generally incentive conflicts when it comes to data analysis and algorithmic design. But we may be worried that basically the person working with the data and either coming up with an algorithm or maybe presenting you with some evidence may not necessarily have the same preferences and we are worried um, that that preference misalignment may lead to p hacking, may lead to inferences that are not reliable, or in the algorithmic context, may end up um, with algorithms that are used in critical applications that do not sufficiently safeguard against um, safety concerns or fairness concerns. And so, what do we do here? We basically apply the kind of principal agent toolbox that is used in this kind of more econ adjacent literature. Uh, to the case where there is limitations in how well we can describe what the agent does with the data, because the algorithm may be too complex to be fully transparent. Um, there is a finest literature, of course, on disclosure and supervision um, that asks questions similar to the ones we ask here for fintech lending, basically asking um, which kind of disclosure do I require from a bank? How can I effectively supervise lending? And so what we connect to here is basically saying, okay, now let's re-evaluate re, um, some of those questions in a world where basically algorithms are used, but these algorithms are so complex that I have limitations in understanding them. 
Then, of course, there's a very active computer science literature on algorithmic explainability that has proposed ways of describing models in simpler ways, but also pointed out limitations in some of those explanations. So what do we want to contribute in this direction? We kind of want to say, let's not see explainability as an end itself. Let's try to motivate it by economic considerations. And let's think about what that implies for which properties we require of explainers. And you know, I'm going to present you with one model and one direction that I think is limited because it talks about a specific context and specific considerations. But I hope more generally um, that this can contribute to us you know, understanding better which specific properties of machine learning algorithms, but also of the explanations we have of them kind of are required in, in specific high stakes decisions where our argument is kind of that it matters to design it right. And it's also what we see now in empirical evaluation. Like there are explainer tools that work pretty well, but they are usually those that are targeted towards a specific application and not necessarily um, general purpose ones um, that haven't been adjusted for specific applications. All right, so I'm now gonna go basically in a very stylized version of our model in order to show you guys an example. But I also wanna make sure that if there are any questions or comments, you guys can stop me. So as um, you know, somebody trained in economics, I'm very used to being constantly interrupted. Um, so don't hesitate to shout at me. Um, kind of makes me feel, um, yeah, like I'm in a, at home in a talk. Um, okay, so what is our main setup? We assume there is some agent that I will call a firm. So the firm is choosing a prediction function. So basically a policy that gets applied to data and I'm gonna assume that it takes the, the utility that I want to maximize. So the goal I have takes a specific form. I basically assume that it takes the form of an expectation of a distribution of data with some outcome Y, some covariance X. And then the utility is gonna be determined by how my prediction function F of X um, responds to the outcome Y. And I'm gonna integrate that uh, over a distribution um, where in this specific case that I'm going to focus on today for exposition, I'm going to more specifically assume that that application um, and the distribution is a distribution of credit scoring data. So Y, I think of repayment, like does somebody repay their loan? X, I think of credit file data. So have they repaid their loan in the past? What are some things I know about their income um, and uh, maybe about whether they, they own a home? Um, and then I want to decide based on this information how to score their credit worthiness. Um, and my utility is then gonna express how good I am at scoring their credit worthiness. So specifically, I could think of different utility functions I could use here. The one that is simplest to deal for me today in terms of the theory and kind of just showing what we're doing here is just assuming that we have a mean squared error loss. So the better I am at guessing credit worthiness in a mean squared error sense, um, the better I am uh, assuming here, the better I am the, the firm is doing. But you could also assume different losses. You could use a likelihood function in order to express the quality of your credit score. Or you could directly say, well, in the end, the um, lender who is a firm here may actually just care about the profit they make from lending. And so maybe you want to choose a utility where they get some benefit from giving somebody a loan and a loan being repaid. Um, when you pay some cost for giving somebody a loan and the loan is not getting repaid. And I'm using this credit score together with a cutoff to decide um, who should get credit. So specifically, I'm assuming here um, in this model that there is a um, that there is a cutoff and I'm saying I'm giving everybody the credit whose probability of repaying according to my estimation is above a certain threshold. Um, and then if I give somebody credit and they actually repay on the left here, I'm getting a benefit that is equivalent to the interest rate they pay me, or I have a cost that is equivalent to kind of the cost of me um, for going the loan and then maybe having to sell the loan to somebody at, at a lower cost who is then trying to get that back, yeah. So you're thinking about f of x producing not a zero or one, producing a probability. Yeah, so I'm assuming basically that the object of interest is a continuous object. You could argue that in some applications, only the zero ones will matter. The continuous version is more easy for me to handle in the application. But yeah, so I assume that even if um, my goal is giving out credit, I care about the credit score. The practical reason why I would why I think about this is realistic is that 
it's not typically the case that a credit score only matters at one cutoff. Like you may get different credit, lo different loan terms. You may have an option of credits that you offer to somebody. So I'm thinking that generally has value in a good, in a well-fitting credit score, not just around the kind of cutoff for giving you loans or not. Yeah. So we need to optimize them together jointly, the cutoff and the ideal function. Okay, so your question is, um, don't I have to optimize the cutoff and the function together? Um, absolutely. I would argue that in this formulation here, I can implicitly do that because I could just shift the function. So in this kind of, I would simply think of, I shift the credit score and I give somebody a higher credit score. If what I really mean by that is that I give more marginal people um, credit or I want to give people with this characteristic credit. That's a good question. Right, and so I'm now assuming that the firm receives a training signal. So basically I think of this as an abstraction. So I'm not gonna explicitly model kind of the statistics of learning here. Um, and we can discuss, you know, where this may be a shortcoming of our model that, that is, has a first order, um, matters to a first order. I'm simply assuming that the firm receives a training signal, which here is assume they simply learn about the distribution of the data so that they're able to solve this optimization problem. Like in practice, they would get a noisy signal about that. So here I'm basically integrating this out and basically conditioning on whatever they have and then taking the expectation with respect to that. So in this case here, I'm simply assuming they learn about the joint distribution of the covariates X and repayment Y. Um, but I also assume there's a regulator. Um, the regulator may also maximize the utility function, but I assume crucially that that utility function is different. And so just to give you the two examples that I will mainly consider in my talk today. So one example is that the firm maximizes utility the regulator also cares about disparate impact. So the regulator cares about basically people being scored differently across groups. So in this very simple case, I'm assuming that the utility of the regulator is reduced whenever um, one of the groups has a higher credit score than the other. Now in principle, we may be interested in basically the absolute value. So we may be interested in general in any difference, no matter whether it's in one direction or the other, in applications where we know the direction in which we are worried about, I think of this as basically a Lagrangian relaxation of a constraint um, minimization problem. So um, we are formulating in this linear way because it's easier to handle for us mathematically. But you could also think instead of a preference that basically says, I have a distaste for average differences in credit scores between groups. Um, you could also think of other criteria that involve kind of the um, normalizing by some uh, permissible characteristics that I think like credit scores are okay to vary between groups by certain characteristics, but not by others. For like simplicity, I'm assuming the simple criterion, but here kind of the question of, does this map exactly to the policy case matters a little bit. So this formulation basically says, I'm concerned whenever credit scores are different between groups, that's not me mechanically translating to different approval rates at a given threshold, because for that it's only important what the credit score differences are around the cutoff. For simplicity, I'm assuming that I care about credit scores overall here, but I think this is clearly a case where like the setting I have is somewhat stylized here. Um, a second one, a second important consideration uh, is our risk preferences. So um, I may be worried that basically the firm is say risk neutral over different states of the world, they are maximize their expected profit, but that the regulator actually cares about the insure, like the, in this case, lending industry not breaking down in a bad state of the world. And so the way that I model this here, I'm assuming that the risk preference of the firm is just the expected utility that averages over different states of the world. But the risk preference of the regulator is specifically to care about um, utility in the low state of the world, which in many cases you can think of as equivalent as rather than averaging over states, I'm kind of, con I'm, I'm trying to maximize the minimal utility over a number of states. So why have we chosen those specific ones? This may look kind of like a very stylized model. And it turns out that like basically the main, some of the main regulator concerns in financial underwriting specifically are exactly the fairness of decisions, which is sometimes seen as in this um, specific area as disparate impact, meaning how different do I treat people um, and uh, model risk management, which is concerned with the regulator making sure that the lenders don't take on um, excess systematic risk because the regulator is worried that the individual company doesn't take basically externalities into account where one lender going under actually has effects on the overall system and may lead to um, basically breakdown in, in the credit market. 
And there are other considerations that are adjacent to explainability. Um, specifically, there are considerations around having to explain uh, adverse decisions. So there is uh, what I call adverse action notices that are required from lenders. So when they turn somebody down, they have to explain why that is. I think it's also very amenable to an analysis of explainability. The kind of um, utility functions we have in mind today uh, wouldn't be a very good fit for that. So this is why I chose those specific two um, areas of uh, regulator concern. But you know, because I also have uh, two, two co-authors here from, from finance, um, I, I just want to point out that these map to specific considerations that exist in this market. Of course, the model that I have of them is very stylized, but I, I think the mapping to the risk areas is, um, is relatively realistic. So I'm now going to focus on the second. So I, I do think you know fairness is an important consideration together with a explainability. In a way, I'm choosing a different example just to show that I think these insights are more general and because fairness brings up many questions about which criteria we should, criterion we should use. So this is why here I'm, I'm modeling this with risk references. If you look at the draft of, of the paper we have up, um, we actually have an application there to disparate impact as well in the data. But today I, I will talk about different risk references. Um, okay, so now let's go through the steps of our model and specifically the one big deviation we put in relative to a standard model of delegation and regulation is that we assume that this full function that the um, firm chooses is generally too complex for the regulator to fully understand. So basically, I can't write a rule as a regulator that depends on the full complexity of this function f. But instead, I assume I only observe some simple description. So I'm now going to go over like what I see as a simple description today. I'm very happy you know, for any feedback of whether we think that this is a good model. Um, so I'm assuming that the complex function is mapped to a simple explanation. For simplicity, I'm assuming that those explanations um, are themselves taking the form of functions from basically x to y. So they are basically simple proxy models. The reason why I'm doing that, I don't want to end up with things like the fact that you can describe you know, two parameters by one parameter if you just fold it right into like the real line. So I avoid that by saying that we have projections here so that there's necessarily information loss um, from our projection. So a few examples of what this could model. And the first one is the one I'm gonna to use today. So I can think of this as a simple proxy model. So for example, let's say I have a complex model, but I want to describe it with a simple linear projection. So my projection is gonna work by me selecting a set of covariates. So say I'm selecting some of the covariates I think are most important. Maybe do you have a mortgage? And did you default on your credit card last year? And then I'm representing the complex model by a linear projection onto that. So I'm simply giving you a linear projection on those two covariates, maybe an intercept. Um, and um, for the given kind of covariates that I've chosen that is a simple linear mapping that projects uh, onto a simpler function space. I could also think of this as variable importances. So I return a list of variables, um, or I could think of this as an evaluation at only a few points. So basically, I'm projecting a function onto kind of just knowing a, a fixed set of points because I can't query it arbitrarily often. So as the regulator, I can only learn about a few test points. And now I'm thinking about which are those test points I should send you. But in any case, um, the point here is that effectively, our assumption is that I cannot fully understand um, the function. I need some description of it that is simpler and that uh, is gonna generally lose information. I'm not gonna be able to preserve all the information. Um, and now we're considering two very specific kind of policy choices in this framework. We either consider um, an ex ante restriction where I say one, restri restrict one response to this re um, restriction could be, well, if I can only understand a two-dimensional linear projection of your thing, I just tell you that you're only allowed to use two-dimensional linear, two linear projections because then I know exactly what you're doing and I can dictate which function you're using. The alternative is that I leave the function x ante unconstrained. I'm telling you, you can do whatever you want, but then I will tell you um, whether the simple description you have is compliant with my policy. Now, of course, these are two extremes. You could think of things in between. In practice, we have a bit of a hard time kind of imagining very realistic things in between, because if you have very complex constraints on the function space, that may itself be hard to enforce. So we are sticking with those two simple ones here, but you can think of these as two extremes on a, on a spectrum. So let me now kind of just give you a very concrete example to show you what is going on in our model in an example before I tell you a little bit about the general results we have. 
And then I want to take enough time to apply to the data, which I, th I think is the most important or interesting part. So, okay, so our game works in basically four stages. In the rule setting stage, the regulator sets the rule of the game. So this would in this case mean they say, oh, are you allowed to use any model and then a simple explanation? Or are you only allowed to use simple models? And what is the kind of explanation or request from you? In the training stage, the firm learns the relationship in the data. So here, I will make this as simple as possible. So my complex model is simply gonna be a fully interactive uh, model with two variables that are binary. So basically I can fully describe my model by what it does on four different combinations of axes. And specifically, just for illustration, I'm gonna assume that the two X variables uh, are, have you defaulted in the past? So this is my X1 variable. And the second one is, do you have a home equity loan of credit, line of credit? Uh, home equity line of credit. So basically, do you currently have credit um, on um, on some some home equity? And, and I'm going to assume that the um, firm learns about this and then chooses a credit score that can vary with those two axes. Because my world is simple here, I'm assuming uh, when x1 and x2 are binary, assuming this is a fully interactive linear regression just means that I'm allowing for any mapping from the X to the Y, but it's just a convenient representation um, of this. So what I assume here though, is that there is a state, so this should be an S um, that can be high or low, um, where the specific relationship of those variables and credit worthiness may actually vary with whether the econo economy is in a good state and a bad, or in a bad state. And this, the way that I've specifically chosen this here is kind of an economic story. So I just wanna go over this. I'm assuming the economy can be in a high state or a low state. In a high state, the probability of repayment generally is going to be higher. So that may move the intercept here. So high state, generally more people repay their loans or probability of repayment is higher. And at the same time, I think that there may be a specific effect in a high or low state with a home equity line of credit. So let me just tell you the story for illustration. In the end, all that's going to matter here is that this gamma parameter is, is higher or lower. But the, the story that I have in mind is something like, if you are in a good state of the world, then having a home equity line of credit is actually a good sign about your credit worthiness. It means you have some home equity that you can borrow against. So we like that. If you're in a bad state of the world, in a bad economy, we may actually be worried because it means that you already have credit on some of your equity. And so that may actually push you to go under it. For example, the value of your underlying asset um, goes down. So th that would be a typical example where I would say, okay, you know, that's kind of a signal that's very state dependent. Like in some cases, that means something good. In some cases, it means something bad. So we may reasonably disagree between the lender and the regulator about whether it's a good um, idea to give people with a home equity line of credit, credit or not. Um, and so basically in this case, maybe the, the lender would say, yeah, I want to give credit based on that because, you know, most of the times the world is good. So that's a good sign. While the regulator may say, I'm really worried about this because if the economy turns bad, if you give all the people with home equity line of credits credit, then suddenly they all go under systematically. Okay, so then we have an audit stage. The regulator performs an audit with limited information about this function. So rather than seeing the full function, I assume that the audit um, only is uh, depending on, on limited um, information. I'm gonna go into detail um, about more on that. And then the outcome stage is basically consequences and utilities are realized. Here I should say to keep this simple, I'm just gonna run with mean spread error as my goal. So my goal is to basically estimate this probability as well as possible mean spread error, which I think of as an approximation. Yeah. Are you deploying F or? Thanks. Are you deploying F or F hat? Um, so I, I think when I write F hat, I, that's kind of the final choice that gets deployed. And F is basically something I have a preference over. Um, so sorry, this would be a hat, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, sorry. Um, that's just bad notation. Yeah. But the state of the world is known. So is the firm allowed to use the state of the world to actually choose the coefficient? Um, so I'm assuming that this happens before. So I choose my credit scores before I know the state of the world in deployment. Yeah. So I should be precise here, right? There's kind of two pieces of information that we have. I assume that the firm learns about this relationship but it doesn't know whether there will be in a high or low state. So they can learn about the fact that in a high state, it will be one thing in a low state, it will be the other, but they won't know yet which state we will be in next year when people actually have to repay their loans that I give them this year. So that's a good question, yeah. 
Great. Um, so what is the main constraint I put here? And again, like I, I should point out that, you know, this is like the easiest um, illustration because here I'm basically assuming that this four dimensional object is too complex. So think of this as like the complex neural network. And instead the, um, the uh, regulator can only understand a low dimensional explanation, which here I'm assuming is basically the projection on an intercept in one covariate. So I have two covariates, I can only understand the projection onto one. Of course, there's a bit of a gimmicky example. Um, in the uh, example I will show you later that we implemented, like think of one of them an XG boost on 500 variables and the other a linear um, proxy model with five variables. Okay? Um, so the main idea is that this explanation is now lossy. So it kind of matters which explanation we use. And of course, I've kind of constructed this example in a way that this will matter. But the idea being that I could now have this function on the left, like represented by four different values. And then I say, well, I projected either only on x1, so only distinguish between x1 or x2, or, um, or only between 0 and 1 on x1, or on x2, so I only uh, distinguish between 0 and 1 on x2. Right. Okay, so just recapping, so the firm learns this relationship. I've now you know, normalized all the covariances and variances in a way that makes the math here easy to check out. Yeah. So how can the regulator tell that the projection is done faithfully? Uh, so it's a great question. So you are basically asking the question, you know, if there's limited information, why do I know that this projection is correct? Um, I don't have a very convincing answer in the sense that nothing in my model tells you why this is the case or not. For us, it's an assumption that we can kind of verify that this simple explanation is done in good faith or that there is a mechanism to construct it. Some ways you could ensure that is you could have a, basically an intermediary who is able to query the function arbitrarily often, even if the regulator is technologically constrained or where there's, there's IP. You could think of protocols where we can try to ensure that. Here, I'm, I'm, the, the honest answer is I'm, I'm making this an assumption. And I think it's, an, it's a bit of um, one of the open questions I see with this framework is, we're kind of saying you can't learn everything about a model. But there is something you can learn about it that can be verified. Like, how do we justify this gap or how does it look in practice? In my eyes, it's a very practical consideration because these kind of different agents, they already happen even within one company. Like you have somebody building an algorithm and somebody else who wants to make sure that the algorithm doesn't do crazy things. Or so even the, the, the make of the algorithm, even if I fit an algorithm, I can't fully understand the, the algorithm. So I rely on a simple explanation. So I do think this already happens in cases where we may not be worried about this verifiability, but I, I do think it's a great question here. What happens if we have a truly nefarious agent who tries to basically send wrong signals? And I think it's very related to some recent research in explainability as well. Like how can I send you an explanation that make myself look good? Um, we are assuming that effectively the mapping of the model to the explanation is something where we can have design choices over but that those design choices are known by the regulators so they can correctly interpret it. That's a great question. Thanks. I have a related question. Sure. Does it make sense to have the firm choose uh, which projection to do since it knows the entire function? That's a great question as well. So I'm assuming here that it's the regulator who can tell the firm which covariates to project on. And that's gonna be an important policy choice. If it was the firm choosing that, I, I think there's a trade-off, right? Like you think the firm knows more about the distribution, so it knows better which things are informative and not just what is informative on average. But at the same time, you would expect it to report those things where we have alignment over. So now I'm all, I'm pretty convinced that if we, if we allow that to happen, we don't have, end up with an improvement over some baselines because the whole idea is that we want to force the firm to report on those things where we're misaligned over. Um, and that would knock it out. But I think it's a great question. I think both of those point in directions that we are not fully capturing with this model, but we hope would be kind of interesting questions to, to work on based on just this view as kind of seeing it within a principal agent framework. Yeah. Um, great. So um, here I'm assuming that we have a firm who cares about mean squared error and a regulator who cares about mean squared error only in the low case. So. This is like deliberately a very simple model. So there are not, no big surprises in what the kind of preferences look like. The firm would love to simply use the coefficients that are the average coefficients across bad and good states in this model. The regulator would prefer the coefficients from the low world. 
and both agree that the coefficients that don't vary should be used. Um, so what is the first thing we could do? We could simply say, let's just let the firm do whatever it wants to do, and we don't do any regulation. So in this case, this would lead to basically the firm choosing everything, which means that we have a large misalignment and we have a maximal distortion of the choice because it is only geared towards the average case, not towards the low state case. We could also ex ante restrict the, the company and say, you can only use a simple um, function that only depends on a single covariate. So here we've chosen the covariate so that the X1 covariate is kind of more informative about the overall fit. So in this case, we would force the company to say, you're only al allowed to use a, a simple function of X1, but because it's simple, I can force you to do whatever I want you to do. So therefore you're using actually my value of the intercept, but then we are not actually flexible enough to capture well the variation between applicants by um, the other covariates, which in this case would be the home equity line of credit. So for example, if the regulator actually thinks that people with home equity line of credit shouldn't get credit, we wouldn't be able to implement that with this because the first order important information is still gonna be whether they're defaulted in the past or not. So now let's think about different explanations. So if now the regulator cannot process the fully complex one, they basically could use what I would call a best prediction explainer. So that's the explainer that would say, let's try to describe the function in a way that preserves as much information as possible about the function. We've chosen this example in a way where this one is gonna be the regression on X1. So past default by itself is gonna be best at describing variation in the credit score. And therefore, if we use what I would characterize as kind of a, a stylized version of how we usually think of explaining when we do it with purely mathematical axioms, kind of saying, what are the variables that allow me to describe most about the um, variation of the function? Or that's equivalent to basically saying, I want to fit a simple linear model that explains as much of the variation. So for example, I could run a lasso in order to do that and then say, okay, now I have a simple description of this complex function that preserves as much as possible about the prediction. So here what happens, well, it solves some of the problem. It solves the problem that we disagree about the overall level of risk. It doesn't solve the problem that we disagree about the use of this uh, HELOC variable because that is not visible to this explainer uh, because this explainer doesn't see variation by that second variable. Of course, we could have done the opposite. We could have said, well, why don't we instead ask the firm to report how much it varies by X2 now, of course, I've rigged this example so that this exactly gives us the best solution here. So what is the idea here? Well, I'm now explaining the part of the function that we disagree over. I knew that we didn't really disagree about giving people credit based on whether they have defaulted in the past or not. But I know that we disagree over whether um, they um, got a home equity line of credit. So let me choose an explanation where this is the main information I get about your function. Um, and so um, in this case, that can achieve the first best because it would mean that I'm basically exactly forcing you to choose the covariates that I care about uh, while letting you choose the ones um, that we agree on. Right, so that's the main idea. So, so what's kind of the idea when I put this in, in larger framework? So we have a very complex model. So think of it as a neural network, which here I've represented by this full square of four things. But now because I'm describing that in a simple way, different ways of doing that are not gonna be the same. The moment that I lose information by definition, um, I will have a choice which information I preserve. And so my argument is just that in an economic framework that may actually matter for practice. Okay. So what I want to do in, in the last um, 10, 15 minutes is I first want to just sketch out how we think of this model in general, like beyond a simple example. And I then want to show you guys an empirical application where I have a few pictures that argue that that trade-off between basically constraints and flexibility um, in the empirical expectation we have actually, it, it tilts on the side of it makes sense to allow firms flexibility. Yeah. Um, what if there is correlations between those covariates? So that's a great question. So I have basically rigged this example so that there aren't, right? So that um, if I basically restrict, um, for example, if I, if I learn about um, X1, I'm not also constraining X2. The optimal solution here would take, uh, like here, I just don't have any um, interactions because the kind of the distribution here is, um, is chosen so that it's independent. Um, in general, that consideration would be important. So for example, you could, you could be in a case where you say, I care about those two variables which are related to my 
uh, misalignment, but there is maybe one proxy variable that is pretty good at capturing the effect of both of them. So there may be an opportunity. It may also make it harder for you to design the optimal explainer. The general results we have basically tell you, you know, in those cases, what is the prediction problem you solve uh, in basically maximizing informativeness, taking the covariance in interaction into account. But here, the, the reason why this doesn't show up is simply that I assume independence, otherwise it would have shown up. Um, okay, so um, just want to kind of point out a general model that we're that we're writing down to tackle this. So the general model um, that, that we are thinking about in the background here is one where we have misaligned preferences. We assume they can be represented as basically averaging a utility over a covariate space where I'm choosing a function that maps those covariates. Think of these as basically loss functions relative to um, some uh, optimal um, credit score that is optimal for the different uh, for different agents. But then it may also be that the distribution over the axis we care about may also be different. So maybe a bank cares about uh, customers in a certain area, but I'm worried that they're not uh, working particularly well for customers in a different area. So that would incorporate things like a covariate shift where the X distribution changes between what the regulator cares about the firm cares about, a model shift where basically the prediction target changes. I care about basically a differently shifted credit score or um, it would also include distributional preferences where I care um, either about groups differently or um, where I put some um, weight on equality across groups. And I would argue in two slides that I can incorporate this here. And so then the general structure of the delegation game is like before I presented it as saying, first the firm chooses and then the regulator audits. Of course, if the regulator has the ability to punish arbitrarily harshly, I can also flip that around and just say the regulator puts a constraint on the functions you can choose. And then the company goes in and chooses among, among those functions. So the standard way kind of in, in the kind of more uh, economic side of, um, of mechanism design here would be to say this is a delegation game where the regulator has some prior information about the distribution, chooses the restrictions on the functions you can choose, the firm um, then has knowledge about the state of the world and chooses from that. Um, and then the main explanation constraint is that this, con this constraint can't be arbitrary. The constraint can only be based on simple explanations. So I can't put arbitrary constraints on a function. I can't, can't tell you to choose a function that is exactly this function. I can only tell you a function that is within an equivalence class where the equivalence class is defined um, by my um, explanation mapping. And then basically the interesting policy choices in this general model are, when is it optimal to restrict the functions to those that are perfectly explained versus leaving them unconstrained? And if I constrain them, what is the optimal choice of this explainer mapping within some class of mappings? I just want to point out some general results here. So one um, isn't a big surprise um, because that has been pointed out kind of a statistics uh, side of things before the fact that Assume we are in a case where we only care about different distributions. So the firm cares about one distribution. The regulator maybe is particularly concerned about increasing credit to another distribution and then cares about this function also working well on, say, applicants that are not historically in my credit files. So if in this case, the two distributions are the only thing that matters between those two different utility functions, it's only distribution shift. And if basically, the regulator one is absolutely continuous with respect to the firm one, meaning I can learn from the firm one about the regulator one, then the choices are perfectly aligned if I don't put any constraints. Because for every person, I still want to find a credit score that works as well as possible. Um, however, if I constrain functions to be simple, now I have a problem of fitting a misspecified function. Suddenly there's misalignment because the, um, re the regulator wants a misspecified function that works well for one group the um, firm for another. So it's just a, a side note um, that actually in this case, if we just have a covariate shift and we don't take statistical considerations into account, which may mean that it may be hard to basically optimally estimate those functions well for everybody, at least like from this point of view, there is no change in the optimal function. So we agree on the optimal function. We just want to give everybody credit to the best of our knowledge. Um, the fact that the distribution of people I already saw is different from those I will see doesn't change anything about that. So let me therefore now focus on the case that I teased with the risk example. So this would be model shift. 
So now the distribution is the same, but the utilities can be different. So specifically, let's think of this as I have loss with respect to two different targets and we disagree about the target. And um, then if I'm also further assuming that as in the example, I want to fix a explainer by projecting onto a linear model on a subset of the covariates, where the subset of the covariates is denoted by S, then basically what happens in practice is the regulator effectively chooses what those projected coefficients should be. And the firm with full knowledge of the state then chooses the specific prediction function among those that have the right explanation. Um, and so in this case, the interesting general insight is maybe, uh, first of all, the prediction explainer is different from the optimal explainer we should be using here. The prediction explainer minimizes the loss relative to the target. The targeted explainer turns out the one that is optimal here in the sense of maximizes the utility of the regulator is actually the one that targets the difference between those two functions. So I can here basically formally write that the best explainer is the one that is best at predicting the difference between the two targets. And, and what I mean by the target explainer here is I mean, if I have a choice of which covariates to choose, so I can tell the, the regulator which simple model to, to produce, then that choice is exactly the subset so that basically a linear fit um, to, to the subset produces the lowest loss. And so in general, we can then show that basically if the loss from this optimal targeted explainer uh, in being able to predict the difference is smaller than the loss I would get from just fitting a simple linear model relative to my first best, then basically prediction explainer is better than constraining ex ante. I'm showing this very fast because the idea is the same as an example. And I want to show the numbers later, um, but that's kind of the idea of the model. And just want to add on distributional preferences. If I write my distributional preferences as utility, average utility minus a penalty for deviating between the two groups, then I can just rewrite this as a model shift and kind of say that's equivalent to utility where I put some penalty on um, basically treating one group well relative to another. And here it turns out that the targeted explainer is going to be exactly the explainer that in chooses those variables that are most related to group identity. So in this case, the targeted explainer would be the explainer that says, I try to find the covariates that are most indicative of being in one group versus the other, rather than I choose the covariates that are most indicative of whether you are high or low credit worthiness. I can think of extensions where basically the optimal thing is to be combined both. Turns out that in this simple model, that's, that's already the optimal thing to do. I, I know that this was like a very fast run through kind of trying to tease the fact that there's a general model behind this. What I want to do now for the last five minutes is I just want to show you this in action. And specifically, we are now fitting this on a large credit score data set. So this is basically a panel of 50 million people of which we draw a subsample. This case, a subsample of uh, around 400,000 people that we work with. In this data set, um, there is credit score information about basically past financial behavior. So this would be the kind of things that end up in your credit score. I mean, this is basically a company that provides credit scores is exactly the same kind of information. And then we observe um, whether somebody repaid a personal loan. So specifically in this case, we think about credit card loans. So basically did you default on your credit card or did you pay your credit card down in time? There is a lot of missing outcomes here. So there are many people who we don't actually observe whether they repaid, maybe they didn't get a credit card uh, or maybe they didn't apply for the specific product. And so there are many cases where I may have new applicants um, that we don't observe the data for. And in our case, that means we may have training data where we don't know what would happen to those. So there's uncertainty about what would happen to those. And here we're gonna exploit this in a stylized way. We're gonna assume a variation where in a bad state of the world, those people who have missing data wouldn't repay. And in a good state of the world, those people would repay. A more sophisticated model would be one where we use an imputation for those people. Here for illustration, I'm just assuming they're either repaying or not. And basically good state, meaning everybody repays who I don't know about currently. Bad state uh, means everybody doesn't repay or don't know about. Um, and so these are around 20% of our data. Um, the baseline, um, reject, uh, the baseline um, default rate here is around 12% in this. So that of course like moves the overall default rate by quite a bit whether those 20% pay back or not. Um, and then I build a prediction function for credit card default here where I consider three different loss functions. 
let's first think about what the firm would do. Let's assume that the firm that isn't audited just chooses a function that minimizes average prediction loss, averaged over both states of the world. So here, let's just assume in 80% of the world, these people all repay. In 20% of the world, uh, we are the bad state and they don't repay. The regulator only cares about the low state. So they only care about having a credit score that still works well when basically the economy is in a bad state. And the firm that is audited now still solves the same goal that they have. So average quality, because this is what they care about for, for their own goal. But now subject to the constraint that the simple projection of their model agrees with what the regulator wants them to do. So this gives the regulator, for example, the ability to ensure that the overall level of giving out loans is not too high, even in, in the bad state of the world. Now, of course, I should say that this is, um, first of all, this is real data. So this is the kind of data that a firm uh, a, a, um, lender would actually have to take those decisions. Of course, the specific setting with high and low here is stylized. We also in the paper have one um, that specifically uh, talks about disparate impact. So what we do here is our explainers are linear proxy models on a predetermined set of covariates. We implement this with linear regression or gradient booster tree on a total of 500 predictors. If you look in the current draft, there we also have a version with disparate impact where we fitted a neural network. Um, that optimization is a bit uh, complicated and we're still revising this. So I'm showing you this today because the gradient booster trees and linear regressions are giving us very clean results that I can illustrate well. Um, okay, so the last few minutes, I'm just gonna show you pictures of this kind. Um, I know that this may be hard to see from the back, so I'm just gonna talk you through quickly. So we have here two utilities, the high state utility, which is um, the negative mean squared error. So I wanna be on the right here. Um, the high state utility is the negative mean squared error in the high state. The low state utility is the negative mean squared error in the low state. So where do we wanna be here? Um, so here we have a Pareto frontier between those two, which is basically achieved by unconstrained optimization, in this case of our XG boost model, um, where the, oh, sorry, in this case, um, I should say this, we're starting with a linear regression, okay? In this case of the unconstrained linear regression model, then we vary the preference. So down here would be somebody who only cares about the high state utility. The regulator's top left only cares um, about the utility uh, in the bad state, which is also the, the lower utility. So it kind of makes sense that that would be the risk averse, the totally risk averse choice. The firm here cares about an 80-20 split. So it's gonna be somewhere in between. So the first thing we could do is we constrain the um, firm to a simple model. So in this case, simple model means that we are only allowing the firm to use five covariates rather than 500. So quite a dramatic shift, but I should say that there are a few variables that are just very important for credit card defaults. So that isn't actually as bad a reduction, but of course, it actually means that this simple model here is considerably worse than the frontier in all states of the world. But the advantage would be the regulator could now force the firm to choose the point on the top left. So of course, there would be an improvement relative to letting the firm do whatever it wants. So the second thing we do is like, let's say that we are constraining the firm uh, on a exp explained set of five covariates. And let's just start with saying we just choose five covariates randomly. And then we say those five covariates, the linear projection has to be whatever the regulator wants. So we end up with basically a new Pareto frontier. So this is the frontier subject to the constraint. Of course, the regulator is on that because the regulator's model fulfills the constraint. And, but we don't get particularly far out because um, the firm's model is very different. And then the AD solution is kind of up here. So even with this kind of randomly chosen model, we're already increasing the low state utility to kind of a level that the regulator likes better than the simple model while not kind of hurting the high state utility as much. But the idea is that we now can do better. So we could use a model that um, in this case, use the prediction explainer. So the first best prediction information that describes the model well, and that gets closer to where the regulator wants the model to be. Or we could also use an additional model here. And sorry, the somewhat faint kind of moving further to the top left, which is the model that specifically targets the source of misalignment. So in terms of going from nothing to that, we kind of now went from uh, up here to here, but with the kind of, simple regulator model, we would have been on a point, um, the simple model would have been Pareto dominated by that one in the sense that it has considerably worse low state utility 
but also considerably worse um, utility for, for the firm. So of course, you know, this is somewhat stylized because we're using five to make the illustration, but at least it, it shows that that matters here and we see similar results for disparate impact. Um, and then the same here holds true for XG Boost. So I should say that I'm drawing here these nice pictures in the training sample. So this is a view of the optimization because out of sample, these will just not be as nice, but we kind of checked in the rank ordering holds true out of sample as well. Um, just pointing out that if we use XG boost here rather than linear regression, we get, this is not very well drawn because it, it rescales the axes. We considerably um, cut the loss, um, especially in this low case here, um, but, but also in, in the high uh, state here. So we are considerably better. So this Pareto curve is considerably better than the one we got for linear regression. Something we see in general that there's actually returns to using more complex functions on these credit data sets because we can gain additional information. And then we do the same here. So we again see uh, that those constrained sets here lead to an improvement. And so basically here, um, the second best solution of the regulator with the targeted explainer um, is basically um, comparable to the first best with the linear regression in terms of performance. Um, okay, so um, I do think I'm at time. So let me just summarize kind of the main ideas that I presented today. So I basically compare different ways of constraining a firm who may have preferences that are different from that of a regulator. Specifically, I thought about the case of a lender. Um, and um, I consider different choices where I consider an ex ante function restrictions as limits, limits complexity in order to ensure alignment. And I showed that at least in our calibrations here, that is an option that usually leads to far too much of an inefficiency. I then considered best prediction explainers that minimize the overall info loss um, that improve things, but not as much as trying to construct a description of the model that is targeted towards the source of misalignment. Um, I will skip this. I will maybe like make a comment here. The context that we try to connect this to is kind of, there's a lot of discussion about how should we regulate algorithms well. And a typical discussion is about, should we maybe restrict inputs? So we don't allow people to use certain access. And a general consensus in the kind of more methodological literature, that's probably a bad idea because it may be ineffective at avoiding, say, discrimination. It comes at a cost. And second, it could actually even be counterproductive because I don't allow the, the model to basically debias existing data. There's then a push kind of more from the economic side to say, well, we should just do outcome-based audits. So we just see what actually happens and we regulate based on that. But that is limited in that in my eyes, it doesn't fully leverage the ability to describe a function before it's actually deployed. So usually that, they would have to wait for the bad thing to happen. And it often does not allow for counterfactual evaluation. So if something bad happens, I don't really know whether that was because it was a bad algorithm or it was because it was a bad state of the world. So what we see this kind of in is like discussing two intermediate things. One is restricting the model, which you can see of a more general form of restricting inputs, um, which can be very costly as I argued, or one where I uh, basically regulate based on limited information about uh, the model base, um, about the, the model itself, where I basically use, for example, simple explanation of proxy models in order to do some of that. Um, and in this case, we can at least get a, a second best solution um, and kind of just want to add this as you know, one option to the list of things to think about. And so, okay, so to conclude, what is the opportunity and challenge here? So as we move to automated rules, we allow for uh, scrutinizing them systematically even before they're actually getting deployed other than a human decision maker where I often can only do that after and I can't systematically scrutinize their decision making but a complexity means that we are also limited in being able to do so um, the broader context is that one approach to this would be to explain better but that many notions of explainability interpretability and transparency that are very central to machine learning implementation um, and often not kind of clearly motivated out of an economic point of view. And so we wanted to approach this instead from a means to an end rather than means um, in itself uh, approach and say, how do they help us if we have some policy goal in mind? So here we basically pre presented a um, um, principal agent model of regulation where we added this complexity uh, description constraint and then give an answer in terms of those targeted explainers, meaning description of the model that are specific to the application and then relate this to kind of this broader agenda of understanding financial regulation, how it should evolve. 
So uh, thanks a lot for your questions. I'm happy to um, take a few more if you have time. Thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so one alternative is to um, give the regulator query access to the function. Do you think that's stronger or weaker than these explainability based approaches? So that's a great point. So I, I see it as related in the following two ways. Like if you want to take on more literally, you could see a query access as saying a simple representation in the form that I can only see a limited number. So if you think you have query access, but you can't query too often, maybe because there are concerns about intellectual property or technical cons considerations. I think of the query access, it basically gives you a reduced information about the model um, where your simple representation of the model is now only what it does on those limited points. So in that case, I could map it narrowly. I think more broadly, there are maybe ways of thinking of query access as maybe you can actually construct different statistics about the function that are not just individual queries, but maybe I can ask you to calculate certain statistics. I think of all this as basically a process by which I take a very complex functions and I'm a function and try to represent it by a few numbers because a decision maker may only care about those numbers or may not be able to um, compute more of those or because it's, uh, we can't supply more information than that without you know, some privacy concerns or some IP cons um, concerns. So in that sense, I think it still has the same structure that our decision making is based on a simple set of information, um, and then I would basically uh, I would see our model as trying to answer the question or trying to frame the question: What piece of information should that be? Because maybe it's not just the disparate impact on the existing data, because you're actually interested in how the disparate impact will be on a different draw of the data. Even once you've seen the actual disparate impact, you may want to answer the question: Is this because of a bad model? Or is this because of a bad draw or like or a specific draw of the applicants that have changed in in unpredictable ways um, and so you may still want to use information about your model to make those calls and we're kind of saying well in the, the moment that you use this information but it can't be everything at once you lose some information and you gain some information so which information are you okay to lose and which do you want to preserve that would be my uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, just one clarifying question. Uh, we are fixing the level of complexity of the explainer, right? So like in your yeah. example, you need five. You want at most five yeah. uh, covariates. So uh, any comments on kind of comparative statics if we change that a little bit? Because as you mentioned, great in question, many yeah. high dimensional data sets, at the end, only a few variables matter, right? I agree. Um, so my sense just from financial data is that there is a large concentration on a few variables being the first order drivers of either like say differences between groups or of the main um, outcome of interest, but that there is still gain in using the long tail in prediction. So to me, that actually means that there is a way of explaining it relatively well, where we can explain a large part of the variation with a few variables. But in practice, there is so much in the tail that we don't want to give up on that tail in terms of prediction quality. So just from the financial context, I know there are other contexts where you know, maybe there are basically simple models in the set of models that are almost as good as the best models. My sense is that for the specific context of the data, we look at it and the, the large sample sizes we have here relative to some critical social science applications where we not have the same amount of sample that there is actually um, benefit to being, to using all the data. And that that may actually have equity considerations as well, where if we only use some of the standard measurements, these may be those that say minority applicants traditionally don't have in their credit file. And that by using a long tail of data or using non-standard data, we can actually increase credit access for those people who are traditionally unbanned. Uh, so Laura Blattner, my co-author, and Scott Nelson, they have a paper where they kind of make the argument that a lot of the inequity in lending may actually be related to basically noise or missing information um, on the x covariate side. Um, so I, I do actually think that there are strong reasons to think that we should still squeeze out more information, even if it, a few are enough to describe the model relatively well. So this is why I think we, we went in this specific direction in this data set. But I think that may not generalize to all other critical applications. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
in the interest of time, let's take the rest of the questions during our break. Let's thank Yang again.